Bei uns geht es jetzt weiter mit, einem, äh, mit einer digitalen Zuschalte. Und ähm, ja, es geht um das ganze Thema Auto-Abo. Zugeschaltet ist Alain Fisser. Er ist, äh, jetzt muss ich mal gucken, hier hat sich ein bisschen was geändert. Äh, Herr Fisser war nicht ganz klar, ob er es nämlich schafft. Er ist nämlich hängen geblieben. Vielleicht kann er uns dazu gleich noch was erzählen. Aber er ist seit mehr als 30 Jahren schon im Bereich der Automobilität tätig, der Autoindustrie tätig. Und er ist CEO der Firma Link Co., einer Schwestermarke von Volvo. Und Link will das Konzept des eigenen P Pkw neu denken und auch privates Carsharing und äh, Autos im Abo anbieten. Okay, so this talk will be held in English. So this, uh, at this point, I'll switch again to English. Alain, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I could do it in German as well, but it's your choice. So I will, as you introduced in English, I will do it in English. But indeed, I'm happy to be here because I, I'm in the Netherlands right now, came over from Sweden, and my flight was delayed two hours. So it was an, a, a pretty immaculate timing, precise timing. So I'm happy I'm, uh, I'm here. And thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, basically, yeah, I will try to explain you understand in about 15 minutes what Linking Co is all about, what we're doing, why we are doing it, uh, how we're doing it, and then I understand there's some time left for uh, for uh, some questions at the end. And I, I look very much forward for that. And as I said, uh, please you can ask those in uh, in 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 German as well or in any other language. Uh, I was actually, as, as co correctly uh, introduced, have spent my whole life in the car industry, about 34 years, uh, and have been pretty shocked that actually the car industry today is not very much different than it was 34 years ago. The car is very different, but then again, you could almost say that uh, this device has changed more in the last five years than a car in the last 50 years. So it's quite a stagnating industry. That's the way I see it. Whereas outside of there uh, in the world, consumer trends are changing at a pace that we've never seen before. So with that in mind, we said, okay, Mike, my, my, I was asked to, in 2015, I was before I worked for GM, I worked for uh, Opel, as some of you may know, uh, worked for Ford and worked as uh, before this as the, the head of sales and marketing for Volvo cars. Um, I was asked uh, within the group of Volvo cars to start a new car brand. And my immediate question was the one that you see on the screen, does the world need a car brand? And we basically started analyzing uh, a bit almost philosophically what is the car brand? What is the car industry? What has happened? And basically, it started in your country, in Germany, where just yeah, over 120 years ago, the horse was replaced by the automobile. And uh, it's a technological revolution. That's really what it was and what it still is. It was a very uh, technology-driven industry. It is still a very technology industry in uh, industry it was technology it was the horse replaced by an automobile a couple of years later henry ford did mass production again uh, nothing to do with brand with customer experience it's it's making these products these new technological massive invention uh, accessible to a larger audience Interestingly, the, the customer point of view, the whole experience was irrelevant. Words like brand probably didn't exist. Customer experience was nonsense. Um, so basically, these products, as the mass production started, needed to be sold. And the car manufacturer said, well, that's really not our thing. We're technology people. We're engineers. So the, the, the franchising system was born with dealers all over the world. Uh, doing the servicing and the, the selling of the of the cars. And that's what we still have today. Interestingly enough, the business model today, the car manufacturers engineer, uh, design, produce cars, ship them to dealers, and the dealers sell and service them. I know it's a very black and white summary, but that's the reality. That's how it is today. And this model still exists. And if you look, and let's be honest, and I know this is not a very popular chart, but the fact is that as much as there are extremely good dealers around, and very many of them, and there's a lot of dealers that I think are going to be around for a very long time, but the average customer satisfaction 
and performance of the dealer model is is not really a good one. It's a, there's there's a, there's a study in the U.S. conducted a couple of years ago where car buyers were asked their opinion about car dealers, and actually 30% of car buyers in the U.S. prefer to go to a dentist than go to a car dealership. So that's not really quite impressive. It's a very high cost uh, uh, process within the industry. And, if, and the profitability is low. Both the dealer profitability has been sinking over years, as also dealers are forced by the OEMs, the car manufacturers, to invest and invest and invest in a ridiculous way. So we're not saying it's stupid to have dealers. We're not saying we don't like dealers, but we basically said there has to be something else. There has to be a different way. Um, let's face it, I've been in the industry 34 years. In these 34 years, I've never met a customer who tells his children on a Sunday morning, kids, let's go to our car dealer today and let's have some fun. It's not fun. You go to an auto miler, as you call it, you go there if you want to fix your car or to buy it. It's not something that you go to out of excitement. It just doesn't happen. So we basically, when you look at that, and then you look, compare that with this incredibly fast moving world where the trends are moving at a pace that we have never seen before. And some industries that are totally adjusting to this new uh, reality of consumer desires, there is an incredible mismatch. Uh, how can it be that one of the biggest industries in the world is just stable and bulldozers its business model uh, year and decade after decade, but customers are really crying for something else? Of course, you don't change if you make money. Car industry is always has always been profitable, so there is no change. But we basically said, but wait a minute, it cannot be intelligent to just say, we're just going to do what all the others are doing and hope that they will choose for us. So we basically said we have to do something fundamentally different. So we said, let's do control, out, delete. Uh, let's do something very different. It's quite interesting. And I know this becomes also a bit philosophical. I find it quite interesting that all industries in any part of the business world try to own the retail because that's where you build the brand, but that's also where you make the money. The car industry does it the other way around. We insource everything, engineering, manufacturing, production, uh, design, and the only thing we outsource is exactly the retail. Um, is not very clever, I think, and maybe there's a way to change that model. So we said, okay, Let's not do what the others are doing. I'm not saying they're stupid and we are intelligent, but we're at least confident enough that there's enough people out there who are open for something very different. Um, so we said, let's look at which are the trends that exist in, this, uh, in, in the consumer world. And I could spend hours on that. I'm going to make that very short and really summarize the, the current let's say global trends and i think it's very important to see it as a global trends that exist in in the world the first one is as you can see is that i like to call it a dematerialization it is the fact that more and more people care more about an experience than about ownership um, the the whether it's traveling whether it's eating out or is doing cool things so people do things uh prefer to do things than to own things. It's again, it's a dematerialization. It also explains why sharing has become much more accessible than it has been a couple of decades ago. If you would have said 20 years ago, I'm going to share my house to a stranger when I go on vacation, uh, people would have said that is totally ridiculous. Nobody would ever do that. Well, there's still people around who say people will never share their car. I had a colleague of mine saying some months ago, cars are like a toothbrush. You don't share them. It's bullshit. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's happened with houses and it will happen with cars. So the, just to come back to that one element, we see this growing trend across the world. Yes, including in China, which is the biggest premium market in terms of fashion, accessories, etc. Even in China, we see a very fast growing trend going away from ownership to experiences. The, the second element and the second trend is much more obvious. It's connectivity. Uh, you could say that uh, the, the mobility world is now anchored with connectivity. 
if you have uh, teenage children and they get into your new car, they will not say what engine does it have or how many horsepower, they couldn't care less. They will ask, do you have Wi-Fi? Uh, so the connectivity and the mobility go hand in hand. If you have the best car and it's not connected, it's a bad car. So mobility and connectivity become one and hand in hand. People still want to go from A to B, but people want to be connected between A and B as well. And the two are not separate items. They need to be interlinked. Third element is, uh, I would dare to say, the most important one. Uh, our planet is in danger. I think those who deny it are naive or stupid or both. Um, it's it's the, the younger generation care about this planet. Uh, they have a strong opinion. I often hear friends of mine saying, I wouldn't like my child to be born in these days. I tend to fundamentally disagree with that. I may be a born optimist by definition, but I think that it's the millennials of today who will rule the world in a couple of years. They will not take the stupidity mistakes and decisions that people like Trump have taken. Uh, they will stand up for the planet. So I do believe that there is hope, and I believe that no customer, no company deserves employees, deserves customers, if you don't have a truly sustainable footprint and a truly sustainable uh, philosophy and and uh, and and strategy uh, i find it quite in interesting how suddenly the whole car industry claims to be sustainable just because suddenly everybody has electric cars and let's face it without one specific brand on this planet we still wouldn't have electric cars and then all the rest was just catching up just having electric cars doesn't make you sustainable. So there's a lot of hypocrisy there, but that's another topic. So, but I think the sustainable element of any company is absolutely key. So if you bring that all together, then this, these are, this is a generation of people. And in the beginning, we struggle a bit. So who's our target customer? And in a lot, of course, the word millennial is, a, is, a, is used a lot. I'm 57. I'm far away from that. Uh, one thing that I've learned is that those people who hate the word millennial most are the millennials. Uh, but I think what we've also learned is it's not a matter of age. Not at all. It is not with, when were you born. It's, it's about the mental age. And my colleagues say, I say that so that I can include myself in the target customer group, but the fact is, it is not age-driven. It's about mentality-driven. Some people are just open for something else. They may be 20, they may be 75. So it, it's really an, an attitude uh, thing rather than anything else. So what is it that we're then offering? We have a car, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Very short, of course. We, yes, we have a car, uh, but what we're selling is not a car. We're selling is mobility. It's a monthly contract. Uh, in, in Germany, you often call ABO. I, I think there's a lot of marketing, blah, blah, because almost all ABOs in Germany and other markets are just the new marketing term of leasing. Uh, what makes the membership for Lingen Co. unique? Well, first of all, it's only one month. So it, it really is not an ABO. It's more like Netflix or Spotify, where you only have to commit for one month for 500 euros. But more importantly, is every car that you then uh, use, you can share. And the more you share, the more you lower your cost, but also, of course, the more you contribute to a more sustainable footprint, because our objective is not to have more cars on the road, but to utilize them more. 96% uh, of the time, the average car on this planet stands still. And this is an industry that calls itself sustainable. 96%, it's an absolute joke. So we're selling mobility, we're not selling cars. Of course, if you want to buy the car, you can, but our objective is really to, to go on a membership and try also to build a a community to do things fundamentally uh, different. So the, the business model is, is very different. We, we do different things. Uh, we make it very simple. We have a, we, you can shard, uh, share the car in a very, very simple way. Uh, it's, it all goes via your phone. The phone becomes the key. Uh, and we offer also our customers certain perks uh, so that it really creates this, this I would almost uh, say, this bit of a, a community. Uh, we have our own IT structure that we set up so that it all becomes very easy. 
everything ha happens with the app so you can share cars utilize cars amongst each other you can do it with strangers but if you say no i i have two friends who are like me they want the car but they don't want it every day you can basically share your 500 euros contract with these three people and then via the app you make the car available or if you are a company and you have say 20 company cars for your vice presidents or directors instead of having each of them a car you have a fleet of 10 cars and you share it via the app so it's a very simple system that we believe is is it creates a very different model of ownership uh, we do it in a it's as i said it's a month of month to month very simple way to do it and the sharing is a is a very simple way of making the cars available i was a bit slight uh, slow on letting the slides follow what I'm saying, but I think you you got the, the message. Um, so a very simple concept, 500 euros, you have a car here availability, everything is included, insurance, uh, service, maintenance, etc. We come and pick up your car when it needs service. Another point, the car industry, as you know, doesn't make a lot of business or money or even at all on selling cars. We make money on servicing cars. It's a borderline ethic. Uh, we basically say no service is included. That means every car, every time your car needs to be serviced, we actually lose money. So it's in our interest that your car stays on the road and that the quality is very good. So that is now I can, yep, going to the next slide. The car itself, uh, we also there want to be a little bit more revolutionary. Uh, very, very simple. I've always been yeah, amused in the car industry where you you finally make your decision i'm gonna buy a i'm not gonna say a brand a specific car then you go to a dealership you find out there's 15 colors seven wheel sizes seven engines leather not leather leather in four colors and then 120 options it's a nightmare so we basically said let's go away from that we just said blue and black there's two colors and there's a a PF and I have a plug-in hybrid and a normal hybrid, no options, everything is included. So you have to make two decisions, black and blue. Now, if you're gonna ask me, what if I want red? Bad luck, there is no red. So it's black and blue, we make it brutally simple. We don't have leather on any of our cars. We have a specific material called Econil that is made from recycled fishing nets. It doesn't smell like fishing nets, trust me, uh, but it looks very premium and we. it's also for us one of the signs of the, um, um, the the sustainability aspect of our business model. Uh, the car, as you can see, in black and blue, very simple. I think it looks very cool. The interior is very, I think, as, as you see it, it's a very big screen because it's a very digital connected vehicle. We do not have uh, dealerships. Uh, we, I'll show you later. We, as I explained in the beginning, um, the dealerships is for us something that we see as an as a an, an alternative for the car industry, but we want to create an experience in our retail spaces, which we don't really call retail spaces. It's more a marketing expenditure. And the picture that you see behind me is actually one of our meeting rooms in the in the uh, in our club. So we have clubs that look like this. So it's more they will be in the cities. The first one in. Germany will open in uh, August in Berlin. Uh, we're opening a, a small uh, pop-up store in Hamburg, actually in two weeks. So our our network will be not at all like um, a car dealership. They will be small, about 400 meters, maximum square meters, and in the central of the city with only one car, and the car is always in a cage as the beasts. We also have these pop-up stores that travel around. This was last week in Stockholm, which was our first pop-up tour. And that's basically how the, the concept looks. Just the last thing, the name, that's always been interesting. People ask me, where the hell does the name come from? I've read articles that give it a very, very clever explanation. Link is the link between East and West and Co. It's, it's because it's more than a car. That's all bullshit. The, the fact is that five, five years ago, we sat together with two of the colleagues and we said we need a name that really is a bit what Link & Co is all about. It's a bit disrupting the car industry. It needs to be a disrupting, disruptive name that doesn't even sound like a car name. And a lot of people say Link & Company. Some people say Link. It drives me crazy. It's Link & Co. And it's I know it doesn't sound like a car brand, but that's what we also wanted to achieve to do something 
very different. So yeah, when I said in the beginning, does the world need another car brand? Uh, we basically said no, so we decided not to be a car brand. That's basically, I think, the last slide. So yeah, maybe went a bit too long in the time, but I leave it, I hand over back to you. Okay, Alain, I do have a few questions. You say you're not a car brand, yet you are a brand that is uh, marked on a car. You have pop-up stores or stores in Hamburg. So how is it not a new car brand? Yeah, it's, I, and I, I often make the comparison with, uh, with Netflix, which I think we often say Spotify and Netflix. Uh, Netflix is like a company that has uh, revolutionized the, let's say, the film industry or broadcasting industry. Uh, Netflix sells uh, entertainment, but makes their own films and series. And I think that's a bit what we're doing. We, we sell mobility, but we also have our own car. But you will have noticed that to the surprise of many, that the car is not in the center of our communication. It's the tool to offer the mobility services that we do offer. It's where we will not see ads or films from Link and Co saying, here's our car. It has from zero to 100 in, in six seconds. It has 290 horsepower, has so much torque. We don't do that because for us, the car, as good as it is, and it is a damn good car, that's not what it's all about. It's about the mobility and the, the experience. So I can summarize, uh, you are a new brand, but it's not a new car brand. So I guess yeah. that's... <laughs> so you said 500 euros a month for mobility. That's quite a lot, considering that's uh, just for the car. You can, I got it, you can push your, your cost, so you can lower your cost if you share your car. Um, how do you fit in or how do you plan to fit in into a mobility mix like here in Hamburg where you have uh, a good system of public transportation, uh, be it the bus, uh, the uh, subway or be it bikes uh, and car sharing as well. So how does Lincoln Co, I hope I said that in your intro by the way, I didn't call you Link, I hope I said Lincoln Co. Uh, how does Lincoln Co fit into this mobility mix? Yeah, that's a good question. First thing about the 500, I agree 500 is not cheap, it's not a low price, and, and we definitely don't want to be the cheap brand, but if you calculate what your costs, your car costs you today, all the things you don't see in your, whether it's your monthly lease or in your down payments, you, you will find out that 500 euros is actually not a lot at all, but it is, it is, of course, as an amount, it's definitely not something that everybody can afford. We, we know that. But I think everybody who makes a calculation will soon realize, oops, that is a damn good deal. Uh, to your second part of, of the question, and that's the, the part that I like most, I would say what we're doing now is I, is I see step one of mobility. Uh, it's make the using of a car totally different and the ownership of car totally different and the experience different. But I think in step two, what we want to do is indeed go in mobility offers that go beyond that, including, for example, micro mobility. Um, you mentioned that, uh, I don't know, the people who share the car from Lincoln Co, is it always like the same base? Or is it say, three people who share a car and it's always the same three people or three households who share that one car? Or is it um, kind of like, what's what it's called, regular car sharing? Um, I look what car is available in my neighborhood and I say, okay, I want it next Thursday or? Yes, exactly. So the, the two are possible. But you, as the, the one who has signed the 500 euro membership, you decide. So if you make your car shareable for everybody, then it's up to you. And then you, we will have a system like Uber where every user is rated. So you have some certain uh, control on who is going to end. And we will have a system that you have pictures internally and externally of the car before and after. But you decide whether you want to make your car available to everybody or just those two friends that you signed a contract with. In that case, um, the next question that I asked myself personally is, uh, the goal of um, a changing mobility trend is also less cars on the road and less cars, especially less ca parked cars in cities. So see, it's, it's the parking cars that are the bigger problem than the driving cars. But if you offer a car and say, okay, listen, this is the fixed cost, but you can share it and eventually you'll pay what you would pay maybe to use the subway. Um, isn't there a risk that uh, more people will actually own a car that 
isn't then on the road? Or is there a mechanism for you to say, hey, listen, there's so many people in your neighborhood who have already signed up with Link and Co. Um, check out what's, what's available for you to use before you purchase a car and also put it on the sharing market? Yeah, it's, I think it's indeed more the latter. I think what we're saying is that if you look at today, it's almost a, a cliche that at a certain age, in some countries more than others, in, in Germany it's it's very high. The the car as part of the of the of the social economy, uh, people buy a car. Uh, that's what you do, and whether you use it a lot or not, you buy a car at a certain age, and it's become affordable. We're saying, and I'm not saying that what we're doing is going from A to Z, but it's definitely the first step where we're saying instead of buy a car, use a car and let that car be used by more people. So that means that if from our business model, it doesn't radically change the whole street image, but it does change it quite considerably because if, and that is the consumer who decides, we cannot push it, but we will definitely promote it that the more people share their cars instead of just buying one and using it like the toothbrush, as my colleague said, you should have less cars on the road and more utilized. That means less sparked. I like the uh, the comparison to the toothbrush. Um, but how, how is Link & Co then different from a regular traditional car sharing? Yeah, it's, it's well, the car sharing is, I, I would say we have a car, we have a, a distribution network, we give an experience, it's only for one month and, and the sharing is a part of it. You have now so many car companies who offer ABO as you, as you call it, which I okay. think is, sorry to say, a joke because most of the ABOs are leasing. Uh, and then you have sharing companies. And I think what we do is, I, I th if I'm very honest, I think the, in the fairness, the, the ingredients that we have, the car, the car uh, subscription or membership, the the sharing and then the experience are four things that exist but i do not know any company that offers them all four so the sharing companies they have a fleet of cars that are parked somewhere and with your app you can use them uh, the abo companies are the car companies are now saying you don't have to buy it you just buy monthly but most of them sorry it's leasing because if it's more than one month you commit yourself to a longer period but i think what makes us unique i believe is the fact that it's all the ingredients and then on top of that we try to build an experience which you will hopefully soon after COVID experience also in our clubs. So what's your goal for Hamburg? You say you're <laughs> opening you're opening a store here so what's your goal for for Hamburg? Well it's it's I, I couldn't say the exact number for Hamburg but just to give you an idea we launched this the, the problem with launching a new business model is you cannot compare if you use a car brand. If you start a car brand and you offer a C-segment car, you look at the C-segment, you want to do 1% and you say, God, it's 10,000 cars. In our case, it's difficult to judge. So we said, let's launch it. Let's start low key. Uh, we put a target for Europe for this year for 21 for 9,000 members. Uh, which in the beginning, of course, is also cars because you first need to get a, a certain momentum. We had 9,000 members as a target, and we have um, up till now over 16,000 in Europe. So we're, we're, it's, it's, and what is interesting is I told you, we said, let's also sell the cars. If people want to buy it, who are we to say, no, you can't? But about 95% of those 16,000 are going for this monthly model. Uh, and just so that you know about from the 16,000, uh, over 4,000 are in Germany already. So it is, even though we are not present in Germany, you haven't done any marketing in Germany. The, the press and you have now. Like you, exactly. You are helping us to spread the message. So it's working. It seems start to start working. <laughs> um, last question, because we're almost out of time. But you, you said you want to limit the choices. Uh, I'm all for that. Going to dinner with my husband generally takes a long time until he's picked what he wants to eat. I generally can tell him by the time we go to the restaurant what he will eat, but he'll still need time to decide. So maybe that's a good thing. But um, we'll hear a talk later, and there the dinner will be um, that personalizing your car and the experience is actually a big part of driving, be it your own car, be it a different car. And 
So it's, you're taking that completely away. Do you th you think yes. that? I mean, obviously you think yeah. that will work, but how do you <laughs> how do you how do you conquer and say okay, or how do you um, go against and say no? Um, actually, I don't think uh, cars need to be personalized, or the experience needs to be personalized. Well, I, I I would be, and this may sound arrogant, but I think we we are not the kind of brand that says we want to please everybody. Where the brand says this is what we stand for, and if you don't like it. If you want a red car, bad luck. There's all others have a red car. Uh, I've always said, and we had long discussion about that. And believe me, even within my company, people thought I was totally crazy. Uh, but we said I, we're going to do it anyway. My thinking has always been: it's if you if you go into a fashion store and you find a super cool Prada jacket. You don't go to the lady in the shop and say, "I want it in brown with blue buttons." Prada has decided that's how it's going to look, and you. But you might it. buy it in three colors. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and we said that's probably that's it is also part of a premium brand is to make the choice limited, but we then make sure that the cars on the road are really good looking, and if people they want the personalization, I would dare to say there's so plenty brands that will offer that. We believe there's a lot of customers out there that just want a really good looking car with everything on it and don't necessarily want to paint it pink. I would almost say some customers need to be protected against their own taste. <laughs> Maybe we're doing that as well. <laughs> Alain, um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I imagine we'll be speaking about this uh, whole uh, subject a few more times in the next years. And uh, welcome to Hamburg. And uh, we'll see. Yeah. Good luck, I want to say. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the questions also. And uh, good luck with your event. Thank you. Thank you.